Welcome to episode 20 of the Strategic Momentum Podcast. I'm your host, Connie Steele. The potential for AI to drive significant value for businesses is greater than ever before, but where should leaders start? Today's guest is Steve Brown, Director of Einstein Analytics Specialists at Salesforce. With experience in startups as well as Fortune 100 companies, he has always had a passion for inventing the future. And he's been on the forefront of operationalizing new technologies to help build and grow businesses for much of his career. And in this episode, Steve shares his perspective on what it takes to successfully implement AI in your organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, Steve. All right. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So tell us a bit more about your background and career journey. So while you're currently at Salesforce and head up an amazing team of analytics specialists in the Einstein Group, you've had a pretty broad background and and it includes marketing, sales, and engineering roles. (laughs) Yeah, it's been, uh, I guess you could say, a bit unconventional. And uh, I've had fun along the way. It's been a ton of fun. But yeah, it's been bookended by two very large companies and IBM at the beginning of my career and now Salesforce. Uh, but in between, I was really able to explore a number of smaller ventures and, uh, and help grow them. So I've seen, I've seen small and large. But yeah, I started as a software developer. So I've had fingers on the keyboard. But uh, then I had the uh, opportunity to, to grow from scratch uh, a venture within MicroStrategy where I worked at the time. Uh, it was called Angel, uh, and it was you know the early days of the cloud in the late '90s, early 2000s. Uh, and we actually patterned ourselves after Salesforce uh, to some extent. And the, we called ourselves at that time a software as a service, or even ASP. And we were starting a hosted service to disrupt the call center market. And it was great. You know, a, a business could go there, uh, say like Flywheel, right? You could go to angel.com, get a toll free number in real time, powered by speech recognition, set up all the, the phone tree, uh, even, even agent cues. And then somebody would call up your phone number and it would say, thank you for calling Flywheel. Uh, just say the name of the person you'd like to reach. Connie Steele. All right. Transferring to Connie. And so it really projected that big company image for our uh, smaller customers. And that really started me on the, this train of thought of when you've got an end-to-end service like that, it's really compelling to just enter into a, an agile you know, model uh, of bringing that to market because you can get that, that customer uh, feedback. So that was great. We grew it from twinkle in the eye to few tens of millions in, in revenue, and um, uh, eventually it sold to uh, to a bigger company, Genesis. But it certainly gave me the taste for the startup world, and I I liked that. I liked that idea of inventing the future. So did four different startups between Angel and Salesforce, and I think it's fair to say I was kind of two for four. <laughs> <laughs> All four really great stories, but uh, one just sort of steady growth in the in the mobile workforce management space. One that was API management called Epiphany that's now uh, been acquired. It was acquired by Microsoft and it's Azure API management. And then two that were, I think, good ideas, but uh, they just ran out of runway. So now I'm thrilled to be at Salesforce, where I've been for two and a half years, and as you mentioned, leading a group of uh, analytics, and AI specialists bringing our technology to market. So it's interesting that you've went from the startup cultures, which I know you're passionate about, to a big company like Salesforce too. So tell us what drove you to such a large organization like that, given in particular too, you know, your interest in working in agile environments as you mentioned before. And I don't know, think most people think of large um, organizations as being able to be very agile. Yeah, it's interesting. When I look back through this common thread of my career, I have always found myself, regardless of the company size, in groups that were smaller, innovating, kind of driving the future. Even when I started my career at, at IBM, which then became Lockheed Martin, I was in an internal research and development lab. We were literally seeing how to 
put commercial equipment into uh, submarines and Navy ships. And that was iterative, rapid prototyping, a lab type environment. After a, a series of startups and sort of considering my next move, I'd been using Salesforce in one form of, or another since its inception in 99. When I was at Angel, we actually developed an integration to what was called their CTI adapter uh, at the time with Salesforce. So I've been a App Exchange partner with Salesforce, which is their partner ecosystem. Uh, at our smaller ventures, uh, I was the one bringing Salesforce in. And I even built a side project called uh, Haystack on with an E, H-E-Y stack on Heroku, which is uh, now part of the Salesforce ecosystem. So looking back over the thread of my career, Salesforce was was there for a lot of it. And so in joining Salesforce, I've actually joined this group that is the smaller group within the bigger company. So analytics and Einstein is very new here at Salesforce. I find myself at the tip of the spear helping to, to craft the messaging for our customers and help them understand how to benefit from this. And we are ourselves a pretty small group. We find ourselves very agile uh, with our three releases a year. Of course, Salesforce and, and Analytics and Einstein, these are large leaps every time we're, we're coming out. So it's, uh, it sort of feels like a startup within the, the bigger mothership. Steve, could you give us a quick overview of what Einstein Analytics is? Sure. First, starting with Einstein. So Einstein is the umbrella term for AI, machine learning here at Salesforce. So then there's different products that fall under the Einstein umbrella. So Einstein Analytics, Einstein Discovery. So Einstein Analytics, the ability to kind of slice and dice data, visualize it for users. Einstein Discovery, really targeted at custom AI. So we talk about the spectrum of package, custom, and programmatic AI. Einstein Discovery falls into that uh, custom AI category. But then there's other components of Einstein as well. So Sales Cloud Einstein, Service Cloud Einstein, these are packaged Einstein products for those specific use cases. And then on the programmatic end of the spectrum, we've got Einstein Vision, Einstein Language for actually doing uh, deep learning. So this is analysis of unstructured data, for instance, of images doing object detection and classification and language for doing uh, sentiment and intent on uh, on text. So all of that t- collectively is Einstein and, uh, and then with Einstein analytics and discovery being a, a part of that. There has been so much buzz about AI in the media. Everybody seems to be talking about it these days. But help us understand what it really is and why it's so hot right now. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question because um, it starts off with just, uh, you know, what literally is AI? What does it stand for? And most people will say artificial intelligence, but there's a trend now to, to just call it augmented intelligence, to capture that idea of it's not the invasion of the robots, you know, the sentient robots, but rather it's it's machine learning, AI and machine learning, deep learning to help humans, to help us. Uh, and in the business context, that's to help us do our do our jobs better. And I think what's what's key in bringing this to market is to is to democratize it, to to bring it out of the lab environment where it's been. Uh, it's been more of a science project type of technology to date. Again, particularly in the enterprise. Enterprises are trying to find data scientists wherever they can, put them in a room, give them a hard problem to solve and say, you know, come come back when you've got a an algorithm and an approach. So we've got this uh, you know huge com- customer base you know for Salesforce. We so we've got those direct contacts with with customers and they're just struggling with with data science and how to make so- sense of artificial intelligence, machine learning. So here at Salesforce, the the key has been considering it a spectrum uh, of AI for CRM, and the for CRM part is really important because it's not about that science project in the lab. Instead, this is about infusing intelligence throughout every interaction that an organization ha- is having with their customers. It's very exciting to, to now reach the stage of evolution in 
in AI or machine learning where we can start thinking about these end-to-end solutions for the enterprise. So when you go in and you talk to potential clients who may not have any familiarity with uh, Einstein um, yeah. or, or obviously AI, are there specific myths and misconceptions in addition to the ones that you had mentioned a bit earlier? Yeah, I think what I see, because I, I deal with pretty large organizations. Uh, so these are organizations that can't afford a team of data scientists, right? And what I see in these organizations is they're trying to build up this uh, walled garden of data science expertise, and they don't realize that there's an opportunity to to really scale AI throughout the organization to make sure that it's not just this uh, small number of folks, you know, in, a, in the lab in the dark room that are tasked with coming up with these world-changing algorithms. That's just too hard. That I, I wouldn't want to be the executive that uh, is thinking that's my only path to leverage artificial intelligence and what it can do for my business. There are certainly proprietary algorithms to be developed for a company and that will need uh, data science expertise. But there are options now in AI and machine learning to start spreading out, widening that circle of folks that can participate in this data-driven revolution. <laughs> you know, take a, a business analyst, for instance, and and to bring it to put it in the Salesforce context, right? We we've got uh, an offering in the Einstein umbrella called Einstein Discovery, and it lets a business analyst come in. So this is somebody who's familiar with data. But they don't know data science. They can't write R code. They don't know Python. They're not a programmer, but they are, say, uh, a wizard at uh, pivot tables, right? Or, or they really know their data. And they're curious, right? And, and this curiosity, you want to empower these folks in the organization. And with Einstein Discovery, it lets them simply take data, a CSV file, or connect to a source system. Um, which can be Salesforce or it could be non-Salesforce, ingest that data in and and just say, create story. <laughs> it's not building, uh, uh, you know, not about writing code, but it actually does build a model in the back end. But that story focuses the AI around a business problem. And the statement of that business problem is very simple. It's either maximizing or minimizing a certain outcome. Uh, like customer satisfaction, uh, maximize customer satisfaction, minimize churn, uh, minimize time to close of an opportunity. And then you just let the uh, Einstein discovery do its work. And in a few minutes, uh, it comes back with really interesting insights about your business that you can then operationalize uh, directly uh, into, into Salesforce to embed that intelligence at the point of interaction. And I like to then describe this to clients as saying, this is not necessarily looking for the the earth-shattering insight, right? The one algorithm that's going to change and transform your business. Instead, it's about embedding a little bit of intelligence at every interaction that your organization is having with your customers, making that service agent smarter when they pick up the phone or answer that chat, making the salesperson smarter when they engage with a with a customer. By knowing, hey, here's the prediction, here's why, and here's what to do about it. So what I'm hearing is applying that test and learn mentality to AI, which I'm sure folks don't realize that's something one you can do. It sounds like a lot of um, these companies you work with think of things maybe almost like that big bang. With that, that has to start with the whole solution with a set with a team of people who are the specialists and and it's boxed into those versus it being something as you mentioned um, more widespread and having a greater set of people being involved in that yeah because the the one key lesson I've learned through my career in leading development teams and being embedded in software is this concept of being agile right I mean we've all learned that here recently that 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 really is the approach so we need to make AI agile and and that means expanding that circle wider than just the small group of data scientists. And I think that really is is the key 
to be uh, to be agile with AI. Steve tells us at Salesforce, they view AI as embedding a little bit of intelligence with every customer interaction. Because in the end, you want your organization to be smarter in terms of knowing how to help them. And the goal is to empower those who are familiar with the business data with additional ways to explore insights from it so they can address a specific objective or goal. Yet they don't need to know data science. What they can do is test out their hypotheses. Next, Steve shares his perspective on what it takes to apply AI in your environment. So Steve, what do you think intimidates potential clients most about potentially implementing AI in their organization? Fear of the unknown. We all can feel that, right? You know, if we don't understand something, then there's an element of fear there. And AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, there's fear there because we don't understand it. The folks that understand what AI can do to their business, and they also understand how to get started. So I guess there's a couple uh, fears there, right? One is, what is AI? What can it do for my business? The other fear is, even if I do understand that, how do I get started? I, I fear that if I get started in the in the wrong way, I'm going to go down a, a bad path. To counter that, it's make it known. <laughs> let's let's start learning. Let's start on this journey together. And what that looks like, again, at, at Salesforce is start just bringing more folks into the fold and exposing more people to this technology in a way that they can grasp, in a way that they can understand that there's not this huge learning curve uh, between them and being able to understand AI and machine learning. They don't have to go out and you know, take a hours and hours of online course to learn Python. <laughs> you know, if that is the, the hurdle, it's just too steep for the organization. So organizations need to find a way with, with us, it's, it's Einstein with Salesforce, just to get started and start learning, start exposing the organization to the capabilities and push that that unknown, that fear of the unknown gradually out of the organization. And do you think that fear of the unknown is this perception they have that they have to have everything figured out from the beginning? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's probably a, a little bit that, that they, they think once they start down this, this journey, that AI needs to be this wow, massive transformation, big bang, as you stated earlier. It doesn't start like that. Just start with a use case that you think would benefit from AI, machine learning, and get started. You know, at Salesforce, that looks like things like uh, lead scoring, predictive forecasting, (laughs) uh, portfolio management. These are really needle-moving use cases that are pretty easy to get started with. So Steve, it sounds like you help your clients break through that fear or concern of implementing AI by taking this approach of starting small with a few use cases or maybe even just one, and then subsequently testing and learning along the way. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, It's about getting started and getting started on a focused use case that's got an identified set of end users. Uh, or customers and a set of data that can support those those use cases and then just connect them connect the use case with the data uh, that that really drives the the benefit that you want to in the organization what other challenges would you also you know highlight because to me that almost sounds like this waterfall approach and needing to figure out what the end solution is from the very beginning when you don't know to really where everybody's moving towards now, which is this, again, test and learn approach. Yeah, we even see it uh, just organizationally, how these groups are set up, right? These data science groups tend to be a group within IT, right? So they're isolated from the business. And the business problems are kind of thrown over the wall to them. And they are these big challenges, like, hey, data science team, come up with an algorithm to help us reduce churn, right? (laughs) Hey, data science team, come up with an algorithm to help us uh, increase our portfolio of assets. And these data scientists, they're they're good at data science, right? They don't understand maybe the nuances of the business problem that's been given to them. So 
coming back to this test and learn approach, you know, back in the angel days, we considered our holy book to be the innovator dilemma by Clayton Christensen, right? And it's all about disruptive technologies and even disruptive technologies being developed within an enterprise, which is kind of the state of AI today. There's this concept of being good enough, right? A data scientist would not understand that concept, right? A data scientist, the algorithm, they are looking for the absolute best algorithm. And they'll measure that to many decimal places of accuracy in language like R squared and recall and precision, right? But fundamentally, there are just too many data-driven questions that an organization has to solve than there are data scientists to solve them. So there needs to be this mechanism of, of empowering others within the organization. And in test and learn, the closer you can get that test and learn approach to the business and hence to the customer, the better. And so it's this idea of federating AI throughout the organization. I think, I think that is key because that's what we're talking to our Salesforce customers about is, hey, we actually do have this, this approach, this product that can help your business analysts do this iteration so they can test the more nuanced questions, right? They don't have to throw the the big problems over the wall. Instead, they can have a thought and say, hey, well, I wonder what the if this is correlated to that, right? And they can just do that themselves in their own time in those moments when uh, when they want to pursue that level of questioning. And that's what starts this agile engine going. And now that business analyst can say, to the data scientist, hey, I've teased out a few scenarios. Uh, I've looked at some correlations. I really think we should point your great resources in this direction. And now we start getting into that agile test and learn approach. You mentioned the need to have the broader organization to be involved versus it being just the data science team. Who do you feel is important to have at the table at the at the beginning and even throughout the implementation experience? So key is the business sponsor. So somebody who is on the hook for moving a KPI within the organization. But then in kind of the day-to-day, daily or weekly cadence in the project, you then need to have that uh, business analyst type of person. So this is the person that, that knows where the use case is going, who the end users are, and, and who's really going to benefit from this, but still has that appetite for data and is willing to, uh, to learn a bit the language of the, of the data scientists and kind of bring those worlds together. And so uh, the data science organization then might be having several meetings throughout the organization or several engagements throughout the organization work with business people in different parts of the organization. And they're able to then sort of multiply their effectiveness by dealing directly with the, with the business people on a regular cadence. To me, it sounds like this shift from being data science or the technology element leading the business, but it's really the business leading the technology implementation, so to speak. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, pulling the pulling the data science into their use cases just to infuse intelligence into what they're trying to accomplish for the business. Part of it is just giving these uh, groups throughout the organization a common language, right? There's uh, another misconception is the idea that data scientists, if you just give them enough data, right, build a big enough data lake, then insights are just going to pop out. We don't have to ask the questions. We're just going to let the data science, you know, the data scientists with all of their data tell us what we should be doing. And it doesn't work that way. (laughs) You actually need to point the data science in a direction. As I mentioned in the case of Einstein Discovery, we do that very specifically. What are you trying to maximize or minimize? If you can't state that, right? Well, number one, you can't use the product, but uh, Number two, you, you really are trying to get back to your word, uh, boil the ocean. Um, it's just not going to work with the, the state of, of AI today. So it's really important to give this common language uh, to folks in the organization 
and point the data science, the AI, the machine learning in a direction that's going to drive business results. To operationalize AI throughout your organization, Steve indicates that you should start small with even one use case and subsequently test and learn along the way. But it also requires you to expand the set of people involved outside of the small group of data scientists that are typically looked upon to drive this. Data scientists can't tell the business what you should be doing. Federating AI ultimately requires you to bridge the gap that exists between the business side and the technical side. Ultimately, you need to create this common language. Let's learn more from Steve on what else it takes to facilitate that. So how do you go about helping your clients create this common language? And it almost seems like create a level of integration and connectivity between the data science team um, and potentially other stakeholders in this whole process to bring AI to life in their in their company. In the case of of uh, Salesforce, it's really about letting that uh, that business analysts, that non data scientists, start getting involved in the game, <laughs> and so that uh, data science does not become something of just the box, right? Where they're not really sure what the inputs are. Instead, when they start playing around with data, right, in maybe a deeper way than they were uh, able to before and see a correlation maybe that's pretty interesting to them, now they can come back to data scientists and where they might not have that language in the beginning. Now they're asking questions like, hey, I see that, um, that these two things tend to, to happen together. Or Einstein Discovery is telling me that this one attribute explains a pretty high percentage of the, of the variation, the difference in this particular case they're starting to take on that language of a data scientist. They don't know the particular terms, right, of, of R squared and, you know, precision recall, like I was telling before, but they, they have the concepts. They're getting the concepts. And now when they start having that conversation with the data scientist, the data scientist can start iterating into and narrowing in on the more precise language. And it, so it's going to bring that business user to the point where they want to go further. And that will, look, we've all tried to learn languages, right? <laughs> Whether it be programming languages, speaking other languages, you've got to have that motivation, right? You've got to be going on a trip, right? You know, you've got to know somebody who speaks a different language. You've got to want to program in that language. So that desire has to be there in the organization. And that desire is going to become, come from business questions that you want answers to that you're getting partial answers to or you're getting close and now you want to take it even that that step further my key takeaway was that when you give the power to the business side who has an idea of what questions they want to ask but didn't have the tool or vehicle to address a hypothesis or even begin to understand what it is it sounds like Einstein enables them to do that, to move that forward, get some data and information to further their hypothesis, share that with the data science team. And what you've done is now created this relationship that didn't exist before between the business side and the analytics side that in the end, they now have a common goal, common business goal that might not have existed before. Exactly right. And then the business side can now operationalize those insights, right? So if you enable that business side to develop that common language, have a, some tools to let them start developing that language, but test and learn themselves, now they know how to get that in the hands of the folks that need it, right? Or they at least know the users, you know, or the customer base that, that need those insights. And again, with, with Salesforce, it's all about operationalizing it at the end of the day. It's about putting the insights from those models on the screen, on the phone, at the point of engagement with the, uh, with the customer. And so now that end-to-end -end process is in place, right? You've got the data scientists doing the, the hard stuff behind the scenes that are, that's really challenging proprietary to the organization. 
you've enabled this whole new class of business analysts to start test and learn. Now they've got a common language. Now they're 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 asking the questions of how can we drop this intelligence right into the conversation that our salespeople, service people, marketing people are having every day with our customers. That's where it starts to take fire. And so I now can fully see what you mean by this end-to-end experience because if you have all these business analysts who reflect the different parts of that customer journey, each of them have a business perspective on the kinds of data they would need. They are able to use Einstein to test and learn a hypothesis they may have, infuse that insight from Einstein, and then obviously work with their data science team to refine it even more, then you're optimizing those processes at every stage along the way so that you are constantly looking at things in a holistic fashion versus it being piecemeal. (laughs) It's exactly right. Look, salespeople want to close deals. Service people want to delight the customers. Marketing people want to engage their customers. Like that, that's what the, the end users are trying to do. In the world of financial services, financial advisors are looking to grow their book of business, right? Insurance agents are looking to, to do the same with a portfolio of clients. And so when you think of now, when, when you push this capability further to the edge, you really start tapping into the needle moving uh, use cases that this technology can drive uh, at the end of the day. If that divide, if that gap between what the organization, what the company wants to do and what they're able to do, if you can't bridge that, that gap, then you're just not, they're not going to benefit from the great data science that they're doing in the lab. And what last words of wisdom do you have for companies who want to implement AI in their organization? Don't be intimidated by it. Organizations now feel this imperative to get uh, started with it. It's a it's a big uh, you know mysterious world right now. It's it gets complex at a at a certain level, but when you first start dipping your toe into into it, just think greenfield. Think what if what if my financial advisors knew exactly who to contact uh, because they're likely to bring more assets into the bank. What if the service person knew exactly the right next thing to offer to the caller? What if the salesperson knew exactly the person to reach out to who's interested in their product and just start moving, get started. At Salesforce, we've actually got something called Trailhead, uh, which makes it fun to explore topics like AI and machine learning. It completely demystifies it. In fact, if you just Google uh, Einstein Trailhead, you can start exploring it today uh, on the web, start dipping your toe in. These are are digestible uh, bites of information that you can ingest in 20 minutes, you know, 30 minutes, and really start down this uh, this journey of learning uh, AI and machine learning. Great. And how can listeners connect with you? They're free to email me directly, steve.brown at salesforce.com. I'm on Twitter at AI for CRM. That's a new one I just created because uh, I thought that was uh, pretty cool. But you can reach out to me there as well. Uh, And of course, I'm on LinkedIn. Great. Thanks so much for your time today, Steve. All right. Thanks a lot, Connie. This was great. To implement AI in your organization, start small. Test and learn with a few use cases because the way to garner momentum isn't going to be through this big, massive transformation. You've also got to expand team involvement and create that common language so that everyone is pointed in the same direction so that ultimately everybody drives towards business results. By helping the business side and the technical side understand what they may need from each other, your organization will be able to fully realize the benefits of AI. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with Steve at steve.brown at salesforce.com via Twitter at AI for CRM or through LinkedIn. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also find us in the Google Play Store and Stitcher Radio. And if you want to hear previous episodes or even get show notes from this episode, you can also visit us on our podcast page at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening 
to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.